And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book of the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites called all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. The word of the Lord. Amen. 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 Exactly. Leave, it, leave it on the last slide there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Yep. Good job, guys, remembering to respond to the word of the Lord with a hearty amen. Let's make that happen, shall we? Oh, I need to get my... I chose this text for our, the sermon today, maybe for obvious reasons. Looks a little liturgical, doesn't it? <laughs> Looks like a corporate worship service, doesn't it? Looks like the body of Christ, or at least in the Old Testament sense, the people of God gathering together as one to worship and I wanted to draw your attention in what's going to be a very short sermon because um, we've been doing a lot of talking and you guys are probably sick of hearing me. But I want to make a couple of points about this liturgy, about this corporate worship service. And I want you to notice what's the content of this worship service. Who can tell me just in a word? What's the content? Bar? Scripture. It's the scripture. More specifically... The reading of the law, right? The reading of the law. The only scripture that they had in the days of Nehemiah, right? And what's the situation? Does anybody know of the people? Aaron's back there making the gospel V symbol. I love it. What's the situation of the people who are having the law read to them? Uh, in a sense, they just, yeah, this isn't the same story as King Josiah who discovered the law in the vault of the palace and the, the people of Israel have been neglecting it for years. This is the context of the remnant coming back to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity and trying to rebuild the place, right? And so this is a people who, though they have been the people of God, have been far away from normal, organized people of God type living. They've been living in exile. And they're trying to reestablish their identity corporately as the people of God. And the one of the first things they do is they get the law of God out. And they read it to the people from morning, early morning until midday. It's the first act of the gathered corporate people of God to remember God's law. And what's their reaction? What is their reaction? Back up two slides, Luke. Next, next slide, sorry. I want verse number nine. Look at the end, verse number nine. 
What's the reaction of the people of God to hearing the law? Maybe for the first time in a while, to be reminded after a period of not thinking about it all that hard, being preoccupied with other things. They mourn and weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. What does it mean they wept? We can imagine a physical reaction, right? Tears were coming down their faces. What's included in that concept? What, what does it mean that they were weeping and why were they weeping? Sorrow. Sorrow for, because of what? Breaking the law. Maybe because they realized that they'd been lawbreakers and hadn't really thought about it all that hard in their days of captivity, being preoccupied, as it were, with other things. Yes. Do you think they were also weeping not only because they realized, again, that they were lawbreakers, but they also realized that they had been inattentive to the things of God for all those years? It's not just that I'm a lawbreaker. The law says, do not covet, and lo, I've been coveting in Babylon for all these years. But what about weeping because all oh, the law of God was mine as a member of his people, as a member of his body, and I never even thought about it for all those years. Regardless of the fact that I was coveting my brains out, I was also living without regard to the law of God, as if there were no law of God that made a claim on me, that gave me an identity in his family. And they're reminded in the reading of Ezra and the government of Nehemiah that they have disregarded it. And so they weep with sorrow, as Rick said. Does that seem like our own situation? I mean, we're not in ca captivity for 70 years, but seven days, right, maybe, between reminders of the law of God between reminders of the mechanism by which he calls us his own, the mechanism by which he divides the world, as it were, into his people and his enemies. How fast do you forget it after Sunday? How fast do you forget it if we forget to mention it on Sunday? We've heard it twice today. Recited or, or, or read Matthew 22, where Jesus summarizes the law, right, and says, "Of these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets." Did, it, did anybody feel a pang of conscience when you heard Jesus saying today, "Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind"? I'm usually okay on that one because I'm a blind Pharisee. But when it comes to the second <laughs> one, I have real trouble. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That Jesus, <laughs> he's a slippery one. <laughs> Never lets you get all the way free. That one always gets me. The proper response to hearing those words, that reminder from Jesus in Matthew 22, is this one right here. They wept when they heard the law of God. Do you know how specific the law of God is? Anybody ever sat down and read the whole thing? It's mightily specific. A million and one chances for it to slay you and say to you, you are a lawbreaker. And also, I forgot all about this passage. You haven't even read this in years probably. Been a whole week since you've been thought about the fact that there was a law. Much less remembering what it says and how it condemns your every thought. That's just the Old Testament law. Then we go along and we read the Sermon on the Mount. And what does Jesus do? Well, he just makes it worse. Right? That's the whole point of that passage in Matthew 22. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Jesus is almost saying, I don't really care what your body does. It's what your heart is doing that's the real problem. And you might be able to control your body just by discipline and restraint and all kinds of other things. But you cannot control your heart. Weep, mourn, and wail because you are undone. Not just because of the law and what it says, but because you haven't thought about it in a while. You've been in captivity to your own preoccupations in your own desires.
and your, the disaster that is your own corrupted will. Give me the next slide, dude. Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. It was in, still in verse 9. Yep. The people wept as they heard the words of the law. But this is a fun sentence or a fun verse because that end of that verse comes right after a quotation from Ezra. Ezra sees them weeping. And he says, This day is holy to the Lord, to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. And he keeps going. Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine. Sweet wine. And send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. Share the party. For this day is holy to the Lord our God. And do not be grieved. Is he contradicting the response of the people of God? to mourn and weep at the reading of the law. Is God speaking through the prophets, through Ezra and the Levites? Is he speaking out of both sides of his mouth here? Because what he's saying through the prophet, through Ezra, through the Levites is, thou shalt not covet. Remember, it was true 70 years ago. Though you've forgotten all about it, it is still true today, and it still binds you today. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Still binding. And then, the same God says through the same messengers, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and share the good news. This day is holy to the Lord our God and do not be grieved. How can both of those things be true at the same time? What explanation does Ezra give? Why should we not be grieved at this grievous thing that we have done, that we have participated in, at this grievous inattention to the important things of which we are constantly guilty? Why should we not be grieved? For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, I got a question for you. This sounds very true. I've heard it in other places in the Bible. It's in the Psalms a few times, I think. The joy of the Lord and strength from God and all that stuff. It's a familiar concept. How does it apply here? In what sense, the reading of the law to the returned exiles and, they, and their weeping at the thought of it, in what sense is the joy of the Lord their strength? What joy? Where does it come from? How does it strengthen them? What do you think? They do it, by the way, don't they? Be quiet. Stop your mourning. For this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing. Because why? They had understood the words that were declared to them. What words? They had understood, do not covet. They had also understood the joy of the Lord is your strength. How do we get to the bottom of that? What's he saying? Rejoice in the fact that it doesn't really matter whether you obey the law or not. Rejoice in the fact that it's not that big a deal. You can go 70 years in Babylon and kind of give the law a pass and not even think about it, and it's going to be all right, no big deal. In fact, what you do, you should do instead, have a party with sweet wine and bring some for the neighbor because God's not all that concerned. No, my friends, that isn't it. That isn't it at all. Do you remember the joy of the Lord that the Levites are trying to encourage the people with actually comes from? It comes from their understanding, not only of the words being declared to them, but of who is speaking them. Who is speaking these words? Who says to your soul, do not come? Who is it that says to your soul, do not covet? This is really important, my friends. What kind of guy is it that says to your soul, do not covet? Is it an angry, jealous, vindictive, watchful, 
list-making judge that says to your soul, do not covet? Is the God who says, do not covet, going, I know you're going to, and I will be there. I will see, and I will have my pound of flesh. Don't just grieve, but be mightily afraid, because I'm going to get you. I overstate for rhetorical purposes, but is that the voice that says to you, do not covet? Oh, on the other hand, is it a God who's just really not all that interested? You know, if you feel like it, try not to covet. Because the covetous life is the unproductive life. The covetous life is the unhappy life. The covetous life doesn't actually lead to health as well as the other kind of life. And so do that instead because I'm just trying to help you. Is that the God who says to you, do not covet? Is that the God that the Israelites understood was speaking to them when he said, do not covet and also rejoice and be strong in the joy of the Lord? I want to suggest to you that it's a third voice, a third kind of voice. It's the voice of a covenant maker that says to his people, do not covet. It's the voice of the ultimate covenant maker who says, I have created a people for myself and I will covenant with them to make them my people. It's the voice of a covenant maker who is also the creator of the universe who brought everything we see into being by the word of his power. The same word that he used to pronounce that law. Do not covet. The same voice said, let there be light that said, do not covet. The same voice. I want to tell you something. Remember what happened. When that voice said, let there be light. What happened? Light. Right? Let the sea teem with fish. And it was so. Right? Let man come forth on the earth and rule all my creation. And it was so. Let man be a living, breathing being. And it was so. Keep all my law. Do not covet. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And even more difficult, love your neighbor as yourself. Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I submit to you today that the Israelites in Nehemiah 8 understood that the same God said all that stuff. With the same personality and the same character and even more, the same purpose in mind. And they saw their lawlessness and they saw their inattention to his holy statutes and they saw their disregard of his presence, of his claim on their lives. And they responded with joy because they understood, as it was explained to them, like the passage tells us, they understood that the God of heaven who brought the world into being by his word always creates what he requires. That is the nature of the creative word of his power, to create what he requires. Do you know why he made you? Because he wanted a people to love that would love him too and lift high his praises and glorify his name and rejoice in his presence with them. And so he spoke the word of his power over us and made it so. And Ezra and the Levites understood this. And they said, in the grand scheme of God's plan for the world, it doesn't matter one whit that they spent 70 years in Babylon ignoring me. It's not about them. It's about me and the creative word of my power. And I have made them a people for myself. And the path they're going to travel to realizing that and rejoicing in my presence is going to involve looking at the law and seeing their brokenness and seeing their rebellion and seeing the fact that they run away from me and covet their brains out. 
And I'm going to convince them that it is my working power, that it is my love that makes them holy. That it is my pursuit of them that makes them remember me. It's my let there be light word over them that makes them law keepers. So rejoice, the Levites and Ezra said to the people. It is not up to you like you thought it was. And I think God's speaking out of both sides of his mouth a little bit because I, I do think that the mourning and the weeping and the wailing that the Israelites are doing in the beginning of this passage is perfectly appropriate. And it's the downside of the gospel V, isn't it? The glory of God is the law. His rule for the world, a reflection of his righteous character. What other response could we possibly have? In seeing the difference between that great character and our own rebellion, other than weeping and mourning and wailing and confession of sin. But I want to tell you, the second word of this gospel in Nehemiah is the second word of all gospel sermons, all gospel preaching. Do not grieve. This day is holy. What day is it that's holy? It's the day where I reveal to you what I really mean by all of that stuff, which is I create what I require. The creative word of my power makes it so. You are my people, called by my name. You are holy unto me. So let's have a party about it. Let's share the good news and the sweet wine with people who don't have enough. Do not grieve. Rejoice. This joy, this joy, is your strength. This joy, the joy of realizing that the Lord God has not just put over you a rule that you cannot keep. He's put over you a rule that you cannot keep so that he can demonstrate his power to keep it for you, to keep it in you, to give you the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ, free for nothing because of his mercy and grace and power. This joy is your strength. Be strong. Do not grieve. Understand the words that are declared to you. I want you guys to go read the law. Read the law in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. Become familiar with it. Say with David, oh, how I love your law. What do you think David said that? Oh, how I love your law. I'm so good at it. <laughs> your law is a daily reminder of how much progress I'm making towards moral perfection. It's such a great time. In the morning, when I read your law and pat myself on the back. No, David knew this. When he read the law, he saw, oh my goodness, I weep for my rebellion and my sin. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me. I wasn't even thinking about it for a whole week. I was in Babylon, not even thinking about the law. And that makes me weep. And now I read it and I realize while I was not thinking about it, I was also breaking it. And that makes me weep. Thank you, Lord, that you create what you require in me and for me. I'm strong because of the joy of knowing of your great love, which overcomes all my obstacles. Praise the Lord. How can you not rejoice when you hear that? Do not raise your hand. Are you a lawbreaker in your heart? Me too. Is it constant reminder of this? Cause for mourning? Yes. Is it also cause for rejoicing? Yes. Because of the voice that says it. I want you guys to hear the voice that says it this morning. The voice that says to you, do not covet. Also says, let there be light. And there is. In Jesus' name. I told you it would be short today. We got to get going. We're all pooped out. But. <laughs>